should be silent. So hello everyone, and um, thank you for thank you for having me, um, and thank you uh, Future Sonic for organi Future Sonic Sonic Act for organising this event. <laughs> Two things going on at the same time. So today I'm going to introduce some of my curatorial work into nuclear culture and into art and nuclear culture, starting with this map which is a time-lapse map of nuclear explosions from 1945 to 1998. And I'm just going to talk over the first uh, half of this film, so you can, you can watch it as I'm speaking. So then I'm going to walk you through two field trips to geologic repositories in France and Japan. And I'm going to end with some artist investigations into radiological site markers. So whilst the slow violence of radiation may render it imperceptible, it's foregrounded through fallout, as we see here, decay rates, burial, and the nuclear archives to come. I'll consider how the evolution of radiation as a hyper-object is shifting from state weapons to private energy to the public sphere, both through uh, anthropogenic radionuclides and geologic repositories. So as we witness the nuclear Anthropocene unfold in slow motion and adapt to living in a radioactive environment, we also need to consider the role and form of the site marker and what the nuclear archive should contain for future generations. So what is nuclear about the Anthropocene? Well, we've probably referred to this several times throughout the conference, the idea that um, the radioactive fallout from the weapons that we're seeing being tested on this map in the background here, that this background radiation is actually foregrounded as a marker of human impact on the planet. But that's a 20th century radiological marker. We're in the process of building a 21st century radiological marker, which is a new geologic layer of high-level radioactive waste deep in the Earth's strata. And this waste, if they are built, these repositories are built, will provide a trace in the fossil record, one that's not yet being fully considered by the Anthropocene Working Group. But we'll start with fallout. So this is a, an artwork by a Japanese artist called Hashimoto, and it provides a poignant record of the 2,053 atomic detonations from the Manhattan Project's Trinity test near Los Alamos and concluding with Pakistan's nuclear tests in May 1998. So whilst the Cold War focused on mutually assured destruction, the fact that if two countries bombed the hell out of each other, no one would exactly win, um, what we're actually doing is uh, singularly assured destruction, which is dropping weapons on ourselves, um, but not just ourselves, our colonies. So we have um, a very asymmetrical view of the Anthropocene here. So where does that leave us today? If we think of T Timothy Morton's conceptualization of radiation as a hyperobject, it's not that radiation has no foreground or background, but that it exists in both fields of focus at the same time. Background radiation has increased through decades of fallout and industry pollution, while sudden accidents and management of waste sharply foregrounds radiation within public view, as we've seen with the Smudge Studio work presented today. So Morton's conceptualization of the hyper-object is that it can't be humanly accessed, sensed, or viewed in its entirety. But I argue that nuclear aesthetics not only deal with the temporality and invisibility, but also enable us to sense radiation as, a located, as located and distributed at the same time. And if you live in any of these test sites, you will certainly sense radiation. So where are we? We're about, oh, 1966. 
So there's two um, different theories about, um, or two different times at which the radiological marker is significant. One is 1945, which is the uh, Trinity test, but the other is about this time here in the, in the mid-60s. In about 1965, you see a, a spike um, on the graph. There's different kinds of anthropological spikes, but one of them is a graph spike, not, uh, the other is a physical spike in the land. But the graph spike is high here because in the 60s, there's a huge amount of atomic testing, which you can see. going to see the ducks at some point. I managed to clear up my desktop, but I kept the ducks. There we are. Okay. We're, we're, there. we're there. So, the ducks are real, anthropogenic or otherwise. So, okay, that's, that's, um, that's the background of fallout. And, yeah, I think uh, when we talk about fallout creating a radiological marker, it's, it's shocking to see that um, the extent of the weapons testing um, in, in the 50s and 60s. Okay. So let's think about different kinds of foregrounding and backgrounding radiation. So. This is a photograph. Um, all the photographs, by the way, I've taken unless they are named as a particular artist. So these are very specific sites and moments in time. So Britain's Trident submarines are deployed at Faz Lane in Scotland, where they nestle into the side of the Grampian Mountains. These mountains were formed 460 million years ago. There we are, 460 million years old. But the uranium used to make the warheads below is much older. Uranium is naturally occurring, and it was formed with the Earth. So the half-life of uranium is used to date the Earth. It's the same age as the Earth, approximately four and a half billion years. These mount, um, the fission of the uranium atoms in the nuclear reactor creates plutonium-239, and plutonium-239 is also used to make nuclear weapons, and that has a half-life of 24,000 years. The next stage of the process is when these weapons are actually exploded as tests or dropped on a population. And the iodine-129 released in the explosion has a half-life of 15.7 million years. So we're looking at some very, very long time frames. And these are the half-life is the decay rate of radioactivity uh, of these radioactive isotopes. So Trident submarines are quite interesting in terms of nuclear research because they're one of the very few moments where nuclear power and uh, nucle nuclear energy and the military capacity of, of the nuclear are brought together. It's the civilian and the military application of nu nuclear capability. And they embody both of those uh, ideas of sort of utopian nuclear modernity as well as uh, the potential of fear and singularly assured destruction. And in Britain, we have 27 old submarines that are rusting, waiting to be dismantled by the Ministry of Defence's submarine dismantling project. This new approach to resource management, a new language of dismantling, has enabled the Ministry of Defence to open up a public consultation process for the very first time. And I've been going to some of these public consultation groups. They seek stakeholder advice through an advisory group which includes representatives of statutory regulators, industry experts, NGOs, academics, activists, community organisations, etc. It's rather odd that sort of 60 years too late, democracy is slowly uh, being used as part of a PR machine. Nuclear decision-making, as we know, has always been outside of democracy. 
And it's interesting that only when the submarines are lying rusting in our dockyards that the problem, that the problem is opened up for public discussion. Like Heidegger's broken tool, we're now conscious of the submarines. They become visible, not only above the surface of the water, laid up in a dry dock, but within the public domain. They float on, in the foreground uh, of our failing, on the edge of our failing democracies. The nuclear reactors from the old submarines will be stored above ground until a geologic repository is built. But in the UK, as in many countries, there's a lot of resistance to, to burying radioactive waste out of sight and out of mind. Now here we have um, a very basic diagram of a geologic repository. Um, you see the little breaks in the uh, shafts going down? Imagine if this drawing was really to scale, the bottom would be down here. So you're looking at uh, 500 meters, between 350 and 500 meters below ground. And on the very top right hand corner of this slide, you can see um, these are Russian submarine reactors that are just stored outside in a kind of car park style. Um, uh, in the middle, you can see German waste. Um, I think that's stored in a salt mine. And then here, Forschmark Waste Repository in Sweden. So every country has vast amounts of radioactive waste that, to be honest, they don't really know what to do with. And the geologic repository seems to have been accepted politically, um, if not totally in engineering terms, as a solution to the final disposal of radioactive waste. But it's quite important um, to think about the difference between disposal and storage when we're looking at these sites. So the geologist's imagination has always been fueled by resource extraction, but now they're concerned with the new challenge of burying, burying high-level radioactive waste deep into sedimentary layers of clay and rock. This is an attempt to reverse engineer radiation back underground, perhaps back into the background. Through European research networks such as Incitec, Modern and the Records Knowledge and Memory Research Programme, humanities scholars are working alongside the nuclear waste industry on the challenges of siting, building and monitoring geological repositories. These research programmes are interesting for us because they deal with the relationship between the social and the technical. And they take um, Latour's actor network theory as, as their kind of uh, investigative model. And they're looking at the social and technical challenges of storing long, of long term waste. They're also instrumental in conceptualizing the field. And they remind us that these technologies are provisional and that testing their long term safety is pretty much impossible due to the timescales involved. So there's one repository actually being built in Onkolo in Finland, and the others are what's called a URL, the Underground Research Laboratory. And these are test laboratories to test the geological conditions, the um, machinery, to look at seismic movement, heat transfer, all of the different um, research that needs to go to take place in order to understand exactly how to uh, put, put this waste underground. So there's now an EU directive that every nuclear nation should have a strategy for uh, building geo storage sites. The only thing that's missing in the photographs that I'm going to show you today is actual radiation. So these are all simulated with heaters to look at heat transfer and not actually dealing with radiological materials. That's um, a kind of, yeah, possibly a failure of the research process. But there's one thing that nu the nuclear industry, science and engineers really can't do. They can't make people want to host a site in their community and they can't market for future generations. And some of them think that artists might help them do that, although it's proving to be quite problematic, as you can imagine. 
So I'm going to show you um, some slides from two field trips. And these are trips with groups of artists, but also accompanied with um, archaeologists, anthropologists, art historians, activists, lawyers, curators, a whole um, kind of mixed team of, of people. So this is Farmer Cooza's dairy herd. And in this picture, the cows were walking towards us. So everyone's slightly giggling or on edge because seconds later we had to run away as all the cows kind of crowded in behind us. So underneath this field is the uh, proposed site for the underground research no, the underground research laboratory is already there. This is the proposed site for the actual uh, finished geologic repository. But the process is very, very slow. Repositories can take 10 or 20 years just to get a license, just to get planning permission to prepare the safety case for building a, a, a site. Another 100 years to build and even longer to fill. And then they will be sealed for up to 100,000 years, or rather over 100,000 years. So here we are meeting a group of lawyers who are working, a huge network of lawyers working in Japan, trying to prevent the restarting of reactors in the closed nuclear power plants. So there's something attractive about the speculative philosophy, deep time scales, and deferred responsibility of, of geological stores. They also conjure to mind elaborate mythologies and future folklore as we try and understand what these uh, sites will mean in the fu future. But these underground vaults of hot vitrified waste are really being researched and planned and built. And every nuclear site I've been to, I have a lecture for at least an hour about the benefits to nature. And of course, nature doesn't proliferate because there's radiation. It proliferates because there's no people. And it's really important to make that distinction, although the nuclear industry seems to think it's otherwise. And here we have the cute reindeer. OK, this is Japan. They have a cute thing, a cute icon on everything in Japan. But uh, even, even the uh, underground research laboratory is branded with this reindeer branding. And they've actually moved a, a herd of reindeer right next to the repository site. And you can, we're looking out of the window at the reindeer with the pictures of the reindeer behind us. So this is the process of vitrification of high-level waste, where the waste is basically mixed with glass, and it's put into a canister like this. So the black section that you can see right in the middle of the picture is, is uh, black glass, vitrified waste glass. And the canister is packed around the outside with bentonite clay. And you can see here that the bentonite is wrapped in cling film. Again, this is at the Horonobe site in Japan. And it's wrapped with cling film to stop it drying out. So although it's supposed to be the most stable clay we have, it's obviously quite volatile. So when the vitrified waste uh, comes out of the reprocessing plant, it's, um, it's very hot. It has a 2,000 watts thermic load. So it has to be stored above ground for at least 60 years before it's cool enough to even go in a repository. After about 60 years, the heat will have decayed to about 500 watts, and that's considered manageable in a repository. And it can go underground. Apparently, when the vitrified waste is poured into the glass, it cracks so much internally that it's totally black, which is why it's black. It's the number of refractions within the, of, of light within the actual form of the glass itself. So these um, underground research laboratories are set up as pedagogic um, experiences, taking you through every stage of the process. In Japan, every time we walked through a fault line, there'd be a lot of water. And this um, 
blue tubing on the outside of the um, tunnel is to capture the water and take it around the side into the drainage gullies at the side. So although scientists rather hope that artists might make visible what's already known, artists are more interested in interrogating the interplay of visibility and invisibility through an investigation of material, conceptual and ethical concerns, perhaps a much broader scope than the anticipated data visualization. And now this is um, a trip to Bour, which is in northern France. Um, this is a site that's at a much more advanced stage and is being built. So the URL exists and then the actual um, geological repository is, is planned to be built. Whereas in Japan, um, they say that the test site is only a test site, that it doesn't mean to say they will ever store waste there, which is a relief because of the amount of water and earthquake fault lines through the site that are sort of every 10 meters. Um, so this is deeper, this is 500 meters underground. So the site has its own hotel, visitor center, and again its own very strong narratives of nature, this time the forest and deer, not so different to the reindeer. Somewhere there must be a kind of pack about how to brand nuclear sites with nature. Now this is a really um, bad slide because it's a photograph of a presentation. If anyone wants to re-photograph the photograph of the presentation and tweet it, I can send it to Kota Takeuchi who makes a whole series of artworks based on this. <laughs> but it's a, it's a really good diagram because it just gives you the sense of the high-level waste and intermediate and low-level waste sites underneath this landscape, the reception area and the digging area, just gives you a scale of um, the 15 kilometer square site in the northern French countryside. This is another kind of waste. I suspect this is um, intermediate level waste. The same canisters, but packed uh, differently. So above ground, there's a whole visitor center, again, that explains physically the process of packing and testing the canisters. So this is called a cell, um, the white uh, canister, and the, or the white tube, and the individual waste canisters slide in uh, to the cell. The whole process is planned to be automated. And the cells come off uh, what's called a drift, which is the big tunnel that you can walk through. So this is the simulation from the outside. I'm now gonna take you inside. So we're now standing in a drift, looking into one of the cells, photographing. And this is an image inside one of the cells. So most of the testing seems to be about the process of getting the canisters into the cells and to do with the heat transfer from the canisters uh, to the cell and to the rock outside. This is the um, access, access route. And this is the view from the hotel of the site. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some artworks. So this work is by um, Kota Takeuchi, and it's called From the Moment of Recording, It Became Peeping. It's a screen movie capture of his desktop from the days following the Fukushima nuclear power plant meltdown. And it, parallels, uh, it shows parallel news feeds and social network sites, all live streaming, some kind of suspended in disbelief as they watch the different explosions at the power plant and the kind of very spectacular plumes of smoke rise into the sky. 
And what's significant about this work um, is, is that, well, firstly, Kota Takeuchi was able to respond extremely quickly to what was going on. Um, perhaps, uh, Jamie, to um, take this time to think about what was actually needed and respond in a very considered way to not panicking, but capturing what was going on around him. So the work's been collected by the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo. And I think it's interesting that the, the museum has collected a number of works that document and archive the Fukushima uh, disaster. So in this way, and in many other ways, all artworks that deal with the nuclear are part of an ongoing archive in that they evidence the complexity of nuclear culture within their time. Art history has a pretty effective system of collecting which is more comprehensive than any industrial archive and the nuclear industry is really struggling with how to um, construct and collect its documents together, what should be included and where um, and, and what kind of access there should be to them. Within nuclear aesthetics, there's a recurring process of replacement and displacement disguised by the language of removal and disposal. A material analysis of the nuclear cycle reveals that, reveals that things cannot and simply do not disappear. So today, nuclear technologies are visible in their failure. We can no longer take them for granted or relegate them to the banality of everyday life. The decommissioning of, of, kind of nuclear infrastructure, stockpiles of waste, and nuclear catastrophes of Chernobyl and Fukushima all impact on the public realm, not just through fallout and radioactive water flowing into the Pacific Ocean, but in terms of public and psychic visibility. The general feeling seems to be that science, of, science has run out of language and skills to solve the next set of problems, certainly the next set of social problems. And for the nuclear industry, that's one of public acceptability. But in the age of the Anthropocene, we're beginning to realize that technology cannot replace the need for ethical, legal, and political structures of responsibility. So more complex cultural strategies are required to make sense of the continuing present and understand how to communicate over long time frames and across generations. And this is where um, many artists are trying to kind of grapple with this um, temporal nature of their work in, in uh, the relationship to radiation as a hyper object and uh, the, the deep time of the Anthropocene. So here you can see Kota Takeuchi's work, Take Stone Twice. So, on the left-hand side is a page from a book, The Economic History in the Modern, modern Age of Iwaki. In Iwaki is, just, is the town just below Fukushima. So it's just below Fukushima Prefecture between, uh, well, it's, in, it's below the nuclear power plant in Fukushima Prefecture between the power plant and Tokyo. And this book was published in 1976, and it revisited a number of site markers in the area. And Kota Takeuchi has revisited it again and re-photographed this site. So the image on the right here is Toka, Kota Takeuchi's photograph of the site um, uh, in 2013. So this work is really important in highlighting the redundancy of the message on static markers over just one generation. So the whole concept of, um, kind of nuclear semiotics and uh, CBOX idea of trying to communicate, find a language that will communicate to people in hundreds of thousands of years is totally ridiculous. We can't do it in one generation. So, Takeuchi has a whole series of works about site markers. And his works move between uh, digital and stone media. They work directly with the discrimination between a monument and a site marker, where the marker has some urgency about communicating a message for the future rather than simply remembering the past. 
for the monument is important as a site of remembrance, but when there is no one left to remember it, it becomes a historical artifact rather than part of contemporary culture. So these works are trying to kind of um, reconsider um, these markers as, as uh, contemporary forms. And I'm going to briefly introduce um, two more works, if I've got time. So this is by, um, this is a site visit with two artists called John Thompson and Alison Craighead. And we went to the low level waste limited site in Drigg, which is in Cumbria. This is like the little brother of Sellafield. It's the, um, it's sort of almost surface waste storage. And again, we had the discussion about nature. Look, there's a heron, it's all fine. And we found these, um, what, I, what I call antique radioactive waste storage canisters from the 1950s, which um, apparently are quite low level now, but they can't move them because they're wedged into the site. And what you can see here is miles and miles of waste canisters that eventually will be covered by uh, what's called a human interference barrier various meshes of woven metal, rubble, and boulders, and eventually planted with a hill. So I was interested in the aerial photography shown this morning, because in a few years, you'll be flying, we'll be flying over these sites with these new um, landmarks, kind of, uh, which will only be visible, really, from the air, and they'll all be waste repositories. So when we were at, that, at this particular site, we were thinking about what it is we're actually trying to mark or what, what, you know, what kind of knowledge do we want to embed or know? What is it that we need to know about this place? Are we trying to mark language or landscape, sites or even decay rates? And the artist decided that the actual decay rate is what's missing from all of this discourse, the actual physicality of the radiation itself. So they proposed to build a series of nuclear semiotic totems, not simply as markers of place, but markers of time, which can be embedded in physical and virtual sites and archives anywhere. So this is the kind of uh, landmark public art version, but there'll also be online and gallery and archived versions as well. And each numerical counter will count down the decay rate of a specific radioactive isotope accompanied with its particular historical narrative and material trace. So rather than visualizing data as anything other than data, the work presents numerical measurement and decay rates as an abstraction. And when we started this uh, project, we were talking about radioactive objects. Um, and we're still talking about radioactive objects, but Maybe the uh, context for this work is the um, anthropogenic radionuclides. So how do these radioactive objects sit as markers within the nuclear anthropocene? And this is the work that I'm going to end on, which is by Cecile Massart, who is a Belgian artist. And she's interested um, not just as uh, the site marker for a specific site, but how that site can be um, activated and animated as a space for inter interdisciplinary and intergenerational dialogue and discussion. She's got a whole series of films and prints which really show the modernity of the nuclear age, or the modern vision of the nuclear age. And this is her uh, slightly complicated proposal, which she presents at nuclear research conferences, um, uh, re repository conferences, to um, rethink the site. So her work is all about the site, marked on, marked on maps, drawn, inscribed in the landscape, concrete marked with symbols. These architectural markers encourage people to continue to add to the site to mark the place over generations and centuries. The proposal includes a laboratory for new forms of social organization, prioritizing interdisciplinary and intergenerational knowledge sharing. 
Her reinvention of the marker, constantly reinterpreted within the present, is very different from the permanent landmarks proposed by the American Human Interference Task Force in the 1980s and 90s. So rather than trying to communicate with the deep future as a semiotic challenge, like Takeuchi, Massart's work contends that the problem is not simply one of the past or future, but one of the continuing present. And I lied, there's one more work. This is um, a performance of the atomic priest at Castle Rig. So just to come back to Britain, and if you know CBOC's paper, you'll be quite entertained by this. And CBOC, I mean, there are very many different views on CBOC. Some people think he's completely mad. Um, others think he was just taking the piss. But basically, the, um, the American Nuclear Authority invited him as a semiotician to write a paper on semiotic markers for nuclear waste sites for, for deep time. And one of his many proposals was... Um, to develop an atomic priesthood and that religion has been an effective way of passing on knowledge and certainly passing on a text over time. So this um, performance takes place very near to the site that has been proposed for a geologic waste repository in Cumbria, which has been voted against uh, by the parish council, but the British government has released a white paper at the end of last year saying that they're going to start the consultation process again. Uh, so they'll just keep going until they get permission, basically. But if you're interested in this subject in the Netherlands, you should look at the Habgog site and Willem Vestlaten's uh, artwork there, which I'm not going to talk about today. But this project from Culp Cumbrian Alchemy deals with... Um, the idea of folklore and embedding nuclear culture in a very, very, here we go, in um, very old forms of language and folklore that will continue to carry on for the future. And when we think about the archive, this work um, considers the nuclear archive as in its broadest cultural form. Now that the Waste repositories are being kind of ushered into the public realm because the institutions can no longer take responsibility for, I mean, they're not going to be around in 100 years, let alone 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years. So there's this sense of kind of release of radioactive responsibility for radioactive materials into the public realm. And my argument for the archive is that if the archives, if the, if the waste is in the public domain, then the archives can also be in the public domain. And the archives don't have to tell a singular story of uh, atomic energy and atomic weapons. They can um, include different narratives. And they can also include dissent. These are photographs of the drawers in the archive that the Cumbrian Alchemy Project have brought. And this really is my last slide. So this is um, a number of different discussions that I've hosted taking place around a reconstruction of James Accord's Round Table, which he built in his Hanford studio in 1999 to bring together nuclear engineers, activists and environmentalists and artists to uh, discuss the radiation at the Hanford site and the cleanup operation. And to a certain degree, we've um, reconstructed this concern um, in a number of different locations in Japan and in London. So the, f the table is a focal point for any exhibition in which people come together and we host round tables. So when I've run conferences, they've been a whole series of round table discussions with people from different disciplines and different countries and also different ages that come together to share their experience.